you went in the military and you hadn't even graduated from high school. Is that no, right? I, I asked for a deferment to finish my junior year in high school. Okay. I was granted that. And then on the 13th of June, I went to Fort Snelling, Minnesota, and uh, I was inducted into the service there. And uh, the first time I had ever been in a city larger than Mankato. Wow. And uh, I, I was a country hick. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, from the, there then, uh, I was uh, sent to Camp Callum, California, between the communities of Del Mar and La Jolla. Mm -hmm. There was uh, uh, an uh, artillery camp there, and uh, a 90 millimeter uh, anti-aircraft artillery camp, and there was a gate or a fence between our camp and another camp, which was called Camp Matthews, which was a Marine training base. Okay. And uh, we shared the infiltration courts, the rifle range, and uh, uh, some of the other facilities. Uh, although we never intermixed with the uh, Marine uh, training unit. I was appointed to uh, an M7 director, which controlled, uh, by tracking the target, uh, I controlled the, f the fuse settings on four 90 millimeter guns. And this way, the information I got by tracking it was transferred into this fuse cutter. And then upon the time when they were going to fire, the, the shell was taken out of the fuse cutter, put in a breech, shot up and fired, which was allowed three seconds dead time until it was fired. It had the ability to fire at 30 degrees, approximately 10 miles. Wow. And uh, it, we fired uh, HE high explosive. Yep. Uh, 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 then also we had uh, uh, armor piercing and point detonating. Okay. And uh, uh, the, the, the uh, Armor piercing was a separate shell. Mm -hmm. Should we uh, fire onto a tank at uh, on the ground, right. uh, we used that. that yep. But then I trained there in Camp Callum, and then uh, <clears throat> uh, I got some boils uh, called carbuncles, mm -hmm. and then I lost part of my training so that when the training was finished, I, there were a few things I had not completed. So my unit at that time was sent to the CBI. And then in turn, I was sent to Fort Bliss, Texas. Mm -hmm. And I went through another training, desert training, uh, although the African campaign had that time come to an end and it was quite going on in Italy and Sicily. Right. And uh, we did a training there, which uh, was basically uh, a desert training. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then uh, from there, uh, I was sent out east to Fort George G. Meade. Yep. And, uh, and then cool. eventually to uh, out, uh, shipped out of Boston uh, up the East Coast and across the North Atlantic right. to Liverpool. Mm -hmm. And there uh, uh, I got my first taste of the war. Right. Uh, as we landed and were un unloading there at the dock, we heard these funny buzzes and, uh, and the dock people told us, those are Hitler's buzz bombs. Then we went in and we, uh, we did some physical training there. Uh, I got to see the 101st Airborne, the 82nd Airborne. They were always on double time, always. Yep. I was so 
happy that we did play <laughs> boxing. <laughs> the, those boys, uphill or downhill, were they double were time. The time huh? And uh, then uh, I was a replacement uh, for in batteries, 456 Automatic Weapons Battalion, uh, Battery C, had gone to make the initial invasion, hit a mine, lost two-thirds of all personnel and two-thirds of all equipment. They were pulled back, we regrouped, and I became a part of that. Okay. We went over to the beach and uh, uh, at the Utah beach. The beach had been established, but the infantry was working at hedgerows. So that we were just a short way into the beach. And uh, 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 we did not get to set our guns up because there, uh, much of the fields that were mined yep. and we didn't dare go in there. Yep. And uh, so we remained in column and uh, uh, for uh, maybe a week. And then came the bombing of St. Lowe, uh, which was uh, something like 3,000 B-24s and B-17s came over there and bombed the city of St. Lowe. Yep. Uh, that was the German very strong uh, supply depot, and uh, they used that to uh, strengthen the uh, resistance right. at the beach. And once bombing was of uh, St. Lowe was over, now General Patton was in England with a makeshift army, mm -hmm. uh, uh, cardboard airbags that yep. looked like tanks and guns. Make believe stuff. It, yep. it was. It was a, a big play. Yep. Hitler swallowed it. Mm -hmm. He believed it, that the invasion, this was merely a sham. Yep. And the big invasion was going to happen there. And then at the bombing of St. Lo, General Patton was given Third Army. We were transferred from First Army to Third Army. Mm -hmm. And it was with them to the end of the war. Mm -hmm. I was with the, uh, with the Third Army, I have five major battle campaign uh, that I was involved in. Okay. That was like a, 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 a Normandy, uh, Southern France, uh, Northern France, Belgium, uh, the Ardennes, and uh, all the way up to the Battle of the Bulge, from what I yeah, understand. Yeah, that, that also. Yeah, and. Uh, so, uh, uh, as a uh, anti-aircraft unit, we were not assigned to any one. We were sometimes with one corps, then transferred to another corps, wherever we were needed. Could you say how many, how many aircraft do you think that you participated well, in shooting down? We were down? credited with something like uh, 36. Okay. And uh, we had uh, quite a number of possibles. Okay because uh, some of them limped off awful bad, mm -hmm. yeah. And most of them were uh, ME 109? 109s and 190s, a few 190s. Okay. They're harder to take down. The 190s are? Yeah, why? yeah. Because they're faster or? Faster and they did eventually arm them, uh, the cockpits. Okay. Okay. Yeah. How about bombers? Did you get a chance to shoot it very many no, of the bombers? No, we left that to the 90s. Okay, the big guys. Yeah. yeah. I think it was in Belgium. Uh, we were moving forward and we, we came to a, a halt because of uh, there was a swift river and the Germans were on the other side, well dug in. And uh, uh, as our engineers attempted to put a pontoon bridge across, uh, they were de uh, defeated immediately. And so, uh, Artillery was called in and, and just really uh, hammered that other side. And uh, it looked like uh, they were going to back off. And then this uh, 
uh, we had our gun position on the higher ground overlooking that uh, pontoon uh, attempt. And uh, uh, one of the guys on our, we had quad 50s, 450s on one mount. And uh, he was uh, 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 our spotter at that time. And uh, uh, we saw that, or he saw that P-50 or that P-47, and he says, uh, friendly aircraft in the right field of fire. So nobody really paid attention. And then all of a sudden it made a nice left wing and, and came down. I saw on the rudder was a swastika. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's Heidi, that's German. And uh, nobody paid any attention to what I said. It's a P-47. No one was on the gun. There was no way I could get over to the gun in that time. I took M1. I fired full eight rounds at the canopy of that P-47. Wow. It went down and behind the trees, and I have no idea if I did any damage or well, At least you scared them off. That's the good news. Well, you didn't come back. That's the good news. The P-47 had heavy armament, yeah, very heavy. Yeah. And uh, I've often thought, well, my little old 180 grain 30 out 6 is not going to do all that much uh -huh. damage. But I attempted. Yeah. I got Herman when he was in early in France. Mm -hmm. uh, it was raining, bad weather, and uh, we were going to set up our 40 uh, outside a very small uh, darf, a small community. The uh, civilians had all been evacuated. There was somebody there, but the Germans had used it as a, uh, a defensive because they could hide well. But now they had been chased out and we were going to set up our 40. And uh, so I and two other guys uh, went in there to make sure that there was no uh, no German infantry in there. And uh, as we were walking, as the Germans retreated, they pulled their artillery out and, and uh, they made tracks in the mud. Yep. And uh, my goodness, uh, uh, this little puppy was a survivor out of that community. And he, he followed us. And he was walking in, the, in that track. And uh, I saw him and I kept going and I looked back and he was still there. Then the third time I looked back, he was closer to me and uh, he couldn't get out. He was too, just little short legs. I picked him up, I put him in my raincoat pocket. <laughs> and then uh, we got to the, checked it out and said, well, it's a good place to set up. And so we did. And uh, we adopted him. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, uh, oh, after a week or so, and everybody was feeding Herman from his own rations, and we, he was just the happiest little pup. And then finally, uh, Johnny McCarthy, I uh, asked him one time, he said, well, what are we going to call him? And, oh, he says, now he was from the Bronx. He says, oh, we'll call him Hoyman the Joyman. <laughs> and that, became his name, Herman. I said, Herman is not a German, he's a Frenchman. Uh, we had a, what we called a bed check Charlie. Uh -huh. At night, that uh, JU-88 or Elsa Mole Hinkle would come flying over and uh, uh, harassing, you know, anti-personnel uh, anti stuff. And uh, oh, it was popping all over. But uh, <clears throat> Herman knew that before it got, we had a call. His name was Herman? That was yeah. Your, that was your name. We had a call from, uh, uh, from a sea battery headquarters. There is a possibility of enemy aircraft in your area and, uh, coming from the south. And uh, we said, we know already. Well, how do you know? So. Herman is down under the gun. He's, he went to hide. <laughs> then at the, when the war was over, it ended on the 9th of May, 
our, uh, our outfit was totally uh, uh, disassembled. Our guns were mass balled. They took the breech blocks out on the uh, eighth of May already, so we couldn't fire at all. And then the uh, uh, and then I was assigned to Bad Tolz, Germany, General Patton's forward echelon. Uh, Munich was his rear echelon and Bad Tolz was the forward echelon. And I was appointed as a, a jeep driver to take officers to wherever they were assigned, Edsbruck, Munich, to go to uh, Frankfurt or to wherever. Mm -hmm. And I had the chance to drive the Autobahn many, many miles. But I was waiting for an officer who was assigned uh, to some uh, place to go. And I was waiting in there and I had my dog Herman in the Jeep. And uh, so uh, an officer brought General Patton's dog, Willie, out for whatever reasons there are. And uh, he was out there and my Herman saw him jumped out of the Jeep and ran right over there, and they were just going to round and around. And I ran over there and I grabbed Herman, and I, no blood was shed, <laughs> none. Uh, he was showing them who was the Alpha. Uh -huh. And the officer said to me, soldier, is that your dog? And I said, yes, sir. And he, he said, well, pardon me, but he said, that is a damn good dog, but you better take care of it. I did, I took Herman back into the Jeep and I took my tent rope and I tied it around his neck and I tied it to the Jeep. And that, Herman did not leave that anymore. And that was the last I ever saw of Willie. Diffendang, Luxembourg, there was a young lad by the name of Paul Moyer. He would come up to our gun position. He was uh, very, very uh, uh, well educated. He spoke English, French, and German, or the Luxembourg German. Uh, he, uh, he could speak them all quite, his English was very good because they were taught that in school. And uh, uh, he came up there and- And how old was he then? Was he, uh, when you first well, met him? I'd say he was, between maybe 12 and 13 okay. in that. Uh, and uh, he came to visit us. I have pictures of, uh, of that he took of our gun crew. I said, you'd never take a picture of our guns or anything like that. You can't do that. Uh, but he did take pictures of what's personal. And uh, uh, then uh, we got moved out of Luxembourg uh, there in the, in the late fall and moved up back into Belgium and when the Germans had that breakthrough, the bulge. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then our outfit was pretty well split and uh, we got a lot of supplies of wherever we were able to get them. And, uh, but in the meantime, we had given Paul treats uh, Oh, powdered milk, powdered uh, potatoes. Uh, you remember the D bar, uh -huh, the, the D ration. Yeah, yeah. Uh, gave him that, uh, uh, things like that. And one day he, uh, he came to me. He says, "Would you uh, honor my mother and me to uh, uh, a supper?" Mm -hmm. You know. Ovenkost, a German supper. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, Johnny McCarthy, my friend, he said, no, I'm not going to go. I said, Paul, I will come. And I went down there. Well, at that time, you had to have your rifle, your ammo belt with the bayonet and the, and the first aid kit and your helmet and the whole schmear. And I went there armed like that. And I went in, and, and I went in, and on the 
mantle of the fireplace was a man in the Wehrmacht uniform. And oh, I said, what am I getting into? And, uh, and I asked him, uh, Paul, I said, who is that? It's my father. He's in the Wehrmacht. He said he worked for the railroad, and when the Germans came here, they took him, put him in the Wehrmacht, gave him a uniform, sent him to Berlin, and he's working on the railroad in Berlin. And uh, I said, do you hear from him? No, he says, we don't. But uh, that she served, the mother came out, served some of the food, and uh, I ate, and the, there was meat. And I said, where did your mother get meat? He says, I, I made a 22 rifle. He said, I have ammunition much. But he says, I shoot a rabbit. <laughs> and so we had rabbit there. We had powdered potatoes. And uh, we ate, I ate there, and it was good. And then uh, his mother came out once more with a loaf and it looked like dark bread. And, uh, and she had to cut it, and there were two pieces. And uh, Paul gave me one, and he took one. Now, she remained in the kitchen all the time. She would never say a word. And uh, I ate it, and I said, Paul, where did your mother get chocolate? He said, that's from the candy bar you gave me. She bars. mixed it in the bread uh -huh. dough. And wow. then, then I ate that, and I said, now, Paul, I will go now. And then I, I left. Mm -hmm. And uh, then shortly after that, we got pulled out. And uh, so when we got to go back, after our stay had just about ended, then the the nephew, my wife's nephew that we were with, he says, I want to see the Alps. I said, what do you think we're in? The French Alps. Says, These are the Alps. No, I want to. I said, all right, maybe we should go to Garbage Parchakirk. And that would be the Alps. So we drove, took off. And that's when we drove near Diffendang. And I says, Craig, let's turn in here. I really would like to stop at Tiffany. And we did. We had a little lunch there at noon. Everything closes down. Schools close, the bank closes, except the cafes. They will feed the people. And uh, we were eating there, and right to the table side of us were two young ladies. And uh, well, we conversed in English. And finally, one of the ladies said, are you American? Said, yes. I said, well, what are you doing here? I said, I, I, I would like to make an inquiry with, about a, an individual I knew back in, in 1944 uh, and 45. Well, well, she said, well, uh, why don't you come to my office? <laughs> she was where, uh, 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 a lady in the in the office there at a college, mm -hmm. it was called uh, the Luxembourg College of Miami. That was the name of it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I went to her office and I asked, and she asked, well, now, who, who are you looking for? And she got on the phone. I said, Paul Moyer. And... Uh, she called the uh, operator and asked if there was a Paul Moyer. And he, finally she got, yeah. She says, maybe this is not the Paul that you are looking for. And so she handed me uh, the phone and I picked it up and I said, hello, Paul? Yeah, he says, do you remember Dennis Bolt? Dennis Bolt, yeah. I said, well, Paul, can I come see you? Yeah, come. He said, well, where are you? Uh, he said, the same house 
have always been generation after generation. They families stay that way there. And was I can't remember where that place was. And the lady says, I know where it is. You go down that cobblestone street to a certain house number and go up those steps, and that's the place. And we did that. We walked, and I walked up the steps and I took that knocker, door opened, there stood an older man. I said, Paul? Yeah, come in, Dennis, come <laughs> in. So we went in on the table where I knew where we ate was a big round hard wood table was a portfolio open with our pictures. I told my wife, come look, I'm not fooling you. <laughs> there are, wow, what a day. I met Paul once more. And how long ago was that? What year was that? 99. 1999. I was 18 when I went in, and on the way home in the, by the Asia, no by the Bermuda. My birthday's on Christmas Day, uh -huh. and I was out on the deck in my shorts. I had never been in such a place before on Christmas, and and. Uh, that day I was 21. I was legal to vote and I could buy a beer. <laughs> and you were on your way out? On my way home. Wow. On New Year's Day, I saw the Statue of Liberty. Wow. 1946. Wow. I, I went to a reunion uh, of the Sea Bat reunion in uh, Grand Junction, California, or the Colorado. And uh, I am the only survivor of our gun crew. Wow. Of our, uh, our sergeant squad and um, Johnny McCarthy and, and uh, Angelo Santoro, some of them, my old friends, they are no more. I, I'm the only one. Well, obviously you did your job well because we- Well, we- We won the war. Yeah. You know, because of guys like you, and we say thank you. Um, and a lot of people don't 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 say that enough. Well, no. I tell you, the, the real heroes are back there. <laughs>